Okay, let's go ahead and uh, continue. I had a question about the exam and what would be allowed in the exam. You can use your book, you can use notes. Anything that we've got on Brackspace, you're welcome to use. I don't want you to use internet access. Uh, you can use M-Design. I will warn you, if there's a problem on the test where you have to use, you know, some method of calculation in the book that has multiple steps, and all you do is you go into M-Design and give it what I've, you know, what I've told you in the problem statement, you just spit out an answer and write down your answer, you can't really get any partial credit because you didn't do any work, right? So either it's right or wrong, and I, I prefer you don't do that. I prefer that you use M-Design to verify that you're doing things right. Because you shouldn't just blindly trust software like that. Uh, for the sake of the project, I understand using the software so you can iterate through things quickly. But what I'd really like to see you do is start to use Excel and set up spreadsheets to calculate things. Because um, once you get used, and, and I, I don't mean that you should pre-make spreadsheets to come into the exam with. You could if you want. But it's kind of hard to know where I'm going to say, okay, given this, this, and this, you know, it's hard to know how to set it up so that it's easy to use on the exam where you don't have to guess and check. But if, you, if during the homework and individual design projects you get in the habit of setting up a spreadsheet to solve your problems, I think you'll find that will really benefit you on the test. So just try it and maybe you'll get a good idea of when you should or shouldn't use a spreadsheet. We were talking about frames and frames are a common component of many machines and it's, it's hard to describe all of the different things. You see, so I just read through the last slide because it's not a good way to really describe all that without showing you some pictures. So let me, let me go through and show you some pictures of frames. We use motorcycle frames because it's pretty easy to find a, a homemade frame that doesn't look very good and compare it to a commercial frame like a Yamaha, for example, where you can tell a lot of thought and experience has gone into the frame design. Anyway, uh, what problems do you typically have with a frame that you're going to have a motorcycle on. Or a bicycle. Think about that. Flexure. Okay, so in particular, I'm thinking about the fact that you've got a fork sticking off the front. And that fork is like a big moment arm. And any forces applied to the wheel get greatly amplified back at this little section. Does that make sense? That's a common problem. It's a problem in bicycles. It's a problem in motorcycle frame design. How do you support those forces? Notice what they've done here. They've made a triangle. You see the triangle shape? That's a great idea because that allows you to, to effectively make this tube bigger, right? It's something you can grab and hold on to. Instead of just having two points of contact and fatiguing and, and breaking off a connection at either end, this is now something bigger. And it's incorporated into more of the frame. See, here's part of it incorporated into the frame. So there's really support. So instead of this point bending like this, it's got support here. That's clever. They've also got a line, and notice they didn't even have to make this go down to the bottom. They made it go to the middle, which generally would be a bad idea, right? Because that means that we've got even a less length effective section, but they've already taken care of that. So now they don't have to make a difficult weld here with a bunch of different parts. They can just make a weld way up here, or a brazier, whatever they use. I, I don't really know. And still have a very good connection, because then the frame comes back together here. And do you notice where these two come together? They've got a gusset to help support there. So that, this is actually a very stiff, very strong design. And somehow our intuition, or your intuition, typically by this point, looks at this frame and says, wow, that's, that's actually pretty good. I can see how the stress wouldn't be terribly high in the various sections of that frame. Now let's look at uh, Billy Joe Bob's design. <laughs> I mean, they're trying to sell them. They look decent. And to their credit, you kind of have to use the materials on hand, right? The Yamaha frame. Well, this is industry, and they can buy whatever they want. So they've got different sizes of tubing here. They've got fairly complicated cuts, which are difficult to weld and control very well. And so, to their credit, at least these people have built something that looks nice. But look how big this section is. What does that do? Well, that reduces its strength, because now we've got that whole moving thing, right? They don't have any gusset support here. There's just two points going to the fork, okay? So there's all kinds of potential problems here. Um, and you can just see that this frame is not as well designed as the Yamaha frame, right? So there's a lot of rules being broken here. There's, there's another one. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, is that back wheel just attached to an eyeball? Uh, I think that there's a, um, I think there's a, a, a dead shaft is what you'd call it that goes through here that's essentially a bolt. 
And so I imagine that, I mean, you can see the chain here, it probably runs a sprocket on the other side. And I imagine there are bearings and you just you put it up and you run it through. Now, I don't know how you adjust the wheel, right, so that it tracks straight or is easier to ride, but there it is. Here's another problem, look at this. See how these forks come out? and they don't go in towards the center of the wheel, so there's this large moment arm here. See that? You can just see that intuitively. Right? So this is not necessarily the best design, but it looks like somebody was pretty successful at building, uh, I don't know what you call it, but standard engine carts and said, hey, why don't I do this industrially? So a lot of them probably has a manufacturing facility somewhere in China cranking these things out. Uh, here's another one that's a little better. This person seems to have a little more intuition. They've reduced the size of the frame so there's not as much wobbling. It's a triangular shape instead of a square shape. I'd be more likely to ride this one, but look at the way the fork is attached at really just one point. Right? They tried to make it look a certain way with this, what would you call that, a chopper design or something? I don't know. Okay? But they didn't realize, and maybe they have, maybe to their credit I can't see it, maybe there's a connection point down here that I can't see. But this, in my opinion, is a better design, even though it's not apparently commercial like the other one was. Now, of course, you might burn yourself on the muffler right there, but that's something else to think about. Here's one that is not perfect, but it's better, right? Let me see. Now, these are people that apparently make all kinds of motorcycles and kits and things. I don't know who they are. But looking at this, you can see that they've essentially designed a beam, right? This is a truss. Trusses are strong. That's a good thing. In a way, there's almost a triangle here. You see the triangle? So the connection to the fork support, uh, there's probably a better name for it than that, is pretty decent. It's not bad. What rule have they not followed? What could they do to make this stiffer that Yamaha did, to make it stronger and stiffer? This is a fairly thin beam. They could have made it a large beam, you see? And that's something that Yamaha did. Essentially, they made a thicker beam, if you will, right? So the stress in the upper and lower cords or upper and lower members is strong, is, is less. They've also got a triangle here on the back. So you see that appearing over and over. You see how you can just kind of see when a frame is well designed? The stuff that we learn in strength of materials is inadequate for analyzing this. But hopefully it's sharpened your intuition a little bit and you realize if you really wanted to analyze this frame, you put it in finite element analysis. See what happens. Where's the stress the largest? Where we're going to need more material or maybe a redesign so that it can, can uh, support the loads that it should experience. So anyway. All right. Um, I don't have the material in here I thought I had. I thought I had the bolting material. I don't. Let's go and look at it. It's in chapter 20. You have to pull out your book or look at it online. It's not 21, I want it to be. Chapter 20. Oh, I remember why. Uh, this author, I like. He has a lot of good stuff. One of the things I don't like is sometimes he'll make He'll teach you something just in the context of an example problem. So he'll give you equations and all sorts of things just in the example problem. And in a way, I can kind of see why he's doing it this time, but I think he could have a few more equations. But anyway, in fact, he does have some equations, but they're in the middle of the, the problem. So if you look on page 648 and 649, you'll see example problem 20-1. And I'm not going to go through this example problem. I work my own problems. I'll let you go through this one as you wish. But the, the point is, You'll need some of the equations he has here. 20-3 is on page 649. And then on the next page, he actually has some equations that aren't even uh, marked. So we'll go through this in exam as an example. But the idea here is that if we want to design a bolted pattern, so something like this, the, the approach we're going to take is to just go ahead and lay out the pattern, okay? decide how many bolts we need, lay it out, where they'll be, and all of that, and then go back and say, okay, given this and given the load, what size bolt do I need to prevent the bolts from shearing off? That's the basic idea, okay? 
Now, along the way, there's a couple of different loads you have to consider. You can think about it this way. If you have a load, P, here, well, that's going to tend to cause a moment about this point. So you can imagine there's a shear load in sort of a, a, a rotation or a, a circular pattern at each of the bolts. But not only that, but the direct load has to be supported also. Not only is there a moment load on the bolts, there's also a shear load because, look, you also have to apply a force equal to P to support the shelf. So this bolt pattern from statics has to apply a load P like this and the moment of P, which is P times A. So there's two things causing shear stress on the bolts. One is the fact that you're essentially trying to shear them off this way, and the other is the fact that you're trying to shear them off this way. Does that make sense? So there's two pieces to take into account. The shear load due to the direct load P is just going to be a vertical type of shear. But the shear load due to the moment is going to be tangent to a circle going through all the bolts. Okay? And depending on where those bolts are, they will be more or less because they will be farther or closer uh, to the centroid of the bolt pattern. And the centroid of the bolt pattern is where we measure everything to, to do these calculations. I won't say any more than that about it in the context of the uh, presentation. Instead, I'll show you more about it in an example problem. Okay? And then finally, what if we wanted to weld that shelf or that, that bracket instead? Well, then we have to somehow figure out what the stress is in the weld. Now, the method we're going to use will remind you of some of the things you learned in strength of materials, but will not be exactly like strength of materials. Basically, we're going to treat the weld as a line. Instead of considering the weld as something that has size, we'll consider it as a pattern, okay, and as a line along that pattern. And from that, we'll have a centroid of the pattern, and we'll be able to calculate the stress, kind of like what we were doing with bolts, at multiple points in the weld. And that way, we can figure out how much weld we need, what the thickness of the weld should be. Now, there's several different types of welding loads. I'm not going to tell you what these are right now. It doesn't matter. There's four basic ones. But it has to do with shearing and direct load and uh, tensile loads and all sorts of things. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. But essentially what we're going to do is figure out how thick does the weld beam need to be in order to support the given load, given that we've chosen a particular design. Now, one thing you'll want to mark, speaking of welds in your book, one of the pages you absolutely need to mark is page 653. <coughs> this page, bless you, is what has the nine different patterns we will be able to use. We will not be able to analyze just any old web weld pattern we want to. We'll only be able to analyze and design these nine patterns. Okay? So it's worth putting a tab on page 653 because that's where these all are. And the equations you need, there's a couple of geometry factors you'll need. Uh, the area of the weld, that's pretty easy. That's just the line length. But there's a parameter called SW and another parameter called JW that depends on the pattern of the weld. And we'll need those equations in order to solve these weld problems and design the weld size. Okay. That's the end of the presentation. Those of you watching the video will now go over to example problems and work those. So, um, and what we're using right now, bright space. Let me get to the right chapter. We're going to go through a couple of different example problems. These example problems take some time. In fact, that one's 20 minutes long. The weld problem is about 30 minutes long. These do take some time. Okay. But it's, it's straightforward once you understand what you're doing. You guys have been good so far. We have theoretically a few extra minutes. So I'm going to shut off the camera at this point, show you some example or some, some uh, uh, videos to wake you up, and then I'll put you to sleep with some example problems. Sound good? Okay.